hand over to you. So colleagues, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today in this con consultation. Uh, my name is uh, William Shomali. For those who uh, I don't know among you, I'm the coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster. And I would like to very much welcome warmly uh, Cecilia, uh, the Special Rapporteur on uh, the Human Rights of IDPs, who will be here to discuss her General Assembly report on learning more for the field protection clusters about the climate change and disaster displacement uh, in specific operational context. Warm well, welcome as well uh, to all of you, uh, field protection cluster coordinators, co-coordinators and colleagues who were able to join us today from across the, clo the globe and to share uh, key examples uh, on climate change and disaster displacement and how the report can be useful for the states and the national protection clusters and eventually for all protection actors. The topic uh, of climate change is a priority area, as outlined uh, in our strategic framework uh, that we have uh, cheekily named uh, protection in a climate of change to show uh, our political interest in this area and reflect uh, the fact that many uh, of you cluster coordinators have raised this as an important uh, issue. As you know, slow onset events and processes are affecting operations across the globe. Uh, this includes uh, in many of your operations. I can recognize the names, uh, flooding, desertification, uh, land and forest degradation, sea level rise, all of them that are leading as we speak to this place. Uh, IDMC records uh, 2000 disasters uh, that triggered around 30 million new displacement across 140 countries in 2019. This is the highest uh, recorded since 2013 and uh, de facto uh, gives an important uh, uh, role of the report of uh, the Special Rapporteur, but also I think it highlights the importance of the Special Rapporteurship itself, uh, the office that is really uh, following uh, the field reality and trying to use uh, uh, your good offices, Cecilia, to, to facilitate the work of protection actors. Uh, it is for us as GPC and clusters on the ground essential to strengthen community engagement and mechanisms for disseminating information on how communities can safely access assistance and provide early warnings to the affected population. Uh, the GPC is working to ensure through its field clusters that mechanisms are in place to reach some of the most vulnerable groups who face these protection risks. Now, uh, I would like, uh, all of you have received the agenda. I would like to hand over to you, Cecilia, to frame the discussion. Uh, during uh, your remarks, I would call on colleagues to start raising their hands uh, or slotting in the uh, comments box uh, uh, so I can hand over the floor to them. Uh, so uh, with this uh, in mind, uh, Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, William. It is so nice to hear your voice again after um, some time. Uh, it's a good evening from my part of the world. Uh, good evening, colleagues, everybody. And I'm very, I'm really very happy that the GPC with the UNHCR has has uh, are organizing this and I know that um, the GPC coordinators and other colleagues from the GPC come also from you know different parts of the world are working in different parts of the world so this is a really a very um, uh, important uh, meeting uh, for me also because and most especially because well you are in the field but also the topic is protection um, of uh, IDPs. As William has so kindly already introduced um, the topic, um, the report will be a report that I will present to the General Assembly in uh, October um, in New York. I don't know if it's going to be uh, in person, but it's a report that will be for the General Assembly. So the scope of this uh, in terms of influence is quite um, large 
And as you may or may not know, the report will actually be um, following the um, a summit on climate change. Um, so there is a, a very good um, um, sequence to the events. But of course, the report, given my mandate, will be on the human rights, uh, from the human rights perspective. And uh, I know protection is quite, it's larger than just uh, human rights, but in human rights, we very much focus on the use of the guiding principles on internal di um, displacement. As William has also um, mentioned, um, it's a timely um, topic, and we have actually decided that um, we will focus on the if ad adverse effects of slow onset climate um, because there is not much um, discussion on this and how it affects not only having, you know, um, triggering internal displacement situations, but how it affects the IDPs in terms of their protection needs and the rights after um, you know they have been displaced and last but not the least in their search for durable um, solutions and as um, you all have the call for um, inputs i'm not going to go through that we're all adults here you know the background you know the objectives and you also know that there are 10 specific uh, areas of consideration that we would like to give attention to in the report and on which we um, specifically ask for inputs. Now, majority, if not, well, a lot of the um, entities, uh, UN entities are actually either at the international level or missions are, um, I have been told, are planning to give institutional um, uh, inputs. And very much so, I do welcome those. And at the same time, the participants in this consultation may also want to provide specific written inputs um, to the call for inputs um, with, with um, focus on any or all. I doubt, I doubt if everybody will be answering uh, all questions that have been posed in the call for inputs. So written inputs for us would really cover all of the examples, analysis, et cetera. There is a word limit because we can only take, you know, so much information. And of course, we are interested in analysis. So for this um, consultation, I think it is not so much merely for inputs, but um, as you, uh, as Nancy has sent to the objectives of the consultation, and I welcome very much, and I thank William for moderating um, this consultation. I really would like to focus um, on two specific um, topics, not so much on the substance as such, um, on which inputs may be provided, but really to discuss how this report will be most effective and useful to states and to the field protection clusters. And this, I mean, you know, what angle should we take? For example, in one of my consultations, um, somebody from the academe said, you know, can you please make sure that you also take into consideration the needs for academic research? And it would be wonderful if you can provide um, some recommendations in the academic community with on, on, on this topic. So, you know, it's like, the, the effectiveness and usefulness of the report. And second, of course, is uh, in, your, in your view, what would be the key issues and essential focus areas that need to be included to make the report complete, which may not necessarily be in the, um, in, in the call for inputs 
or nor uh, taken up in the um, in any of the questions that we have uh, provided. Um, and coming from the from you as field protection clusters, these two topics will be, or, you know, your 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 anal your your um, contribution and analysis of these two topics would really be very valuable because, as I said, you guys are in the you know in the field and you have a lot of experience there, um, particularly with concerning IDP uh, protection and how, of course the climate change and disaster displacement is um, very much an interlinked, um, uh, inter are, are very much interlinked topics that we really need to put out there um, in the international um, field. So I think I will um, stop there, William, and uh, I really look forward um, to this consultation. And perhaps if I may uh, also suggest maybe you, you you may want to to gather some uh, suggestions in you know uh, together and and um, I will and if needed if William uh, thinks it's needed I I can respond to some of those um, concerns or contributions so thanks again very much thank you very much uh, Cecilia uh, I would like to yeah open the floor for the colleagues to uh, to start responding. Uh, let me uh, maybe take a, uh, a quick uh, regional uh, uh, way of, uh, of looking at things. Um, a, a safe bet uh, area of the world where uh, an intervention uh, uh, would be most useful is from the Sahel countries. So I encourage colleagues from the Sahel countries to uh, uh, to drop their names in the chat box, and maybe if we can start with uh, uh, with you, uh, Jose, you just started uh, in Burkina Faso, but I'm sure uh, with your experience on protection work, you have some uh, some remarks to start with. Well, thank you very much, William, and uh, everybody else attending this uh, this meeting. I've just logged in, so uh, if that's okay with you, I would make uh, you know my comments, if any, uh, at a later stage. I'll just be writing down my name here. Uh, for the record, uh, Joseph Fischel, and I am the Protection Cluster Coordinator in Burkina Faso, having started this uh, function last week. Thank you, over to you. Indeed, Joseph, sorry for putting you uh, on the spot. Uh, so uh, let me then uh, proceed with the colleagues uh, as, uh, as their names uh, appear uh, on, the, uh, on the attendance list. Um, Burundi, uh, maybe to start, uh, uh, are you with us, uh, Keith? Hi there, yes, I'm with you. I'm sorry, I've only also just logged in. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Please let me come back. Uh, yeah, please come back to me. Yeah, I'll, I'll join later. I mean, with the contribution. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, then uh, maybe we move to Mali. Uh, Marie Amelie. I'm sorry, William. I arrived like two <laughs> seconds ago. I have no clue what is the question. <laughs> okay, good, good. So uh, we're, uh, yeah, we're starting to feed back to the special rapporteur. I'm uh, sure Nancy will uh, follow up with you uh, bilaterally. Then uh, I'll, uh, I'll look at uh, Georges Patrick. Georges, I think you, uh, you're not... Uh, uh, able to speak. I'll move on to the next. Uh, Georges Patrick, if you have uh, comments later on, please go ahead. Uh, Michel, uh, don't talk. Mm, I believe also uh, it is uh, muted. Uh, did you manage? No. Okay, uh, maybe uh, then uh, Juan uh, Dere, 
any inputs from your side? Okay, everyone is being shy. Uh, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move to safe bets. Uh, Tiziana, over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot use the excuse that I just joined in because it's not true. Um, good morning, Cecilia. My name is Tiziana and I'm working uh, uh, as protection sector coordinator in, uh, in the Libya operation. So uh, for us right now, of course, the focus is uh, mainly on uh, on the displacement caused by the, the conflict. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, it is important to, to put the focus on, uh, on the displacement due to, to climate uh, change. And for me, the interest uh, uh, that I always found is perhaps uh, I see here the, the question about as well the, the role that the private sector uh, could play, for example, and uh, in the stronger partnership that we uh, as a UN can really have with uh, some of the private sector that sometimes have the means in terms of money and have the ideas in terms of creativity and to really pair that to, to try to, uh, to help the governments, even those that are a little bit more shy in going towards uh, a more uh, greener uh, economy to, to really uh, help and in, in, in realizing as well how much the uh, the depletion of human resources can affect not only the displacement, the, the people that are directly affected, but all of us uh, directly and indirectly. So that for me is one, uh, one area in, in number five, for example, uh, to really uh, team up and, and look for a stronger partnership with some of these uh, private uh, sector uh, partners. And then uh, uh, can I think a little bit more and eventually come back or? Uh, yes, absolutely. I don't know if Cecilia has a question for me or anything that she might be interested in uh, let me, knowing. Let me take, let me take a few comments uh, and then we, we accumulate some for Cecilia to, to redirect the conversation. Uh, but maybe now I hand over, thank you, Tiziana, to Anna, Anna Rich. Uh, nope, Anna is, uh, is not able to, at this stage to, to get in. Uh, let me see then, continue with the, with the list. Uh, uh, Doreen, uh, are you with us? If not, let me move uh, uh, to Severin. Uh, in, in Burundi, you're having tough times uh, these days, uh, but uh, would you want to come in uh, with regards to uh, climate related issues? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, ju I just arrived uh, as well, but uh, I read uh, the messages. So, uh, actually, in Burundi, the country has not ratified the Kampala Convention. So, for us, it's always a challenge to, uh, to raise uh, uh, the IDP's problem. Uh, of course, we will always, uh, I mean, uh, highlight IDPs with the cause of natural disaster, because we cannot even talk about the other kind of IDPs. Uh, but at least we can uh, we can prepare some responses uh, for IDPs uh, for natural disasters. Currently, we have a lot of flooding, um, and um, we don't have a lot of capacities. Um, it was a problem because we raised this issue in November 
uh, with Ocha. And actually, no, they didn't want to go on a, a global response plan at the country level. Uh, but finally, we think that it was uh, it should have been a good idea to do that because right now we don't have a lot of capacities to respond in the country and also. Uh, with COVID-19, we are very, very, uh, uh, I mean, we, we have a lot of obstacles to, to bring more, more uh, stocks, capacities. Uh, for example, for uh, shelters, uh, NFI, et cetera, et cetera. Forest protection, um, the, the basic issues are, yes, the significant, significant access to basic services as uh, water, shelter, hygiene. Uh, so for us, it will come with a lot of protection problems linked to this uh, this lack of basic services. Uh, we have a lot of GBV issues coming up. And also, we are not able to be very free to do our job here because uh, we are constantly, um, uh, I mean, followed and uh, controlled by the government, even if they agreed for us to intervene. So it's always a problem uh, of access. And uh, we had also the elections, so it was also something, uh, I mean, more obstacles in the equation. So we had also to deal with a lot of um, intervention of political parties coming up with uh, distributions without uh, telling us uh, for IDPs. So for us, it will be also difficult to coordinate the action with the government, even if they decided to, uh, uh, to agree on our intervention and to ask for our intervention. I don't know if I'm here. I um, just want to intervene. Sorry, sorry, this is Cecilia. I'm sorry, but what country are you working in right now? Burundi. Okay, thank you. So we yeah, just brought all the ideas in the same time. I'm just uh, arrived in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Severine. Uh, much appreciated. Let's move to South Sudan. Uh, who's taking the floor? Uh, Iona? Hello. Good afternoon. Ilona from South Sudan. Um, thank you very much. So just in regard to... Um, so I, I can just say in South Sudan, definitely many of the issues highlighted, I think, um, are, can, are being faced. As an example, um, climate change, it seems, can be leading to a combination of issues such as drought and flood, um, as well, food insecurity is a huge concern, and this also, of course, has its linkages with armed conflict. Um, so one of the key ways we think that the report can be useful at a field level is, look, enabling the strengthening of linkages with early recovery, Ena supporting and enabling earlier and better linkages uh, with development actors at the beginning of a humanitarian response or earlier, linking in with early warning mechanisms at the regional level, such as the AU, uh, and so these can be some of the, the ways, you know, just we hope that through the report, uh, um, the impetus will sort of be, you know, or sort of like everyone will be reminded of the need to work more closely together and have better linkages um, in this regard. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ilona. Uh, any additional thoughts from, uh, from other participants from uh, South Sudan? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, hi, William. This is Kavita, hey, the former cluster coordinator. Hi. Uh, just to introduce Sophia. Sophia is taking over from me as the cluster coordinator. But uh, just to add, I think it is very important for the protection clusters to, to, to essentially continue our engagement with the special repertoires. For example, look at the IDP Kampala Convention in itself. We earned a lot of milestones 
because of the very very good work of the of, of the special reps on the on the whole IDP issue we were able to get South Sudan to actually ratify the convention and now there's a draft law in South Sudan also in place which also tackles issues of of of, of climate change and displacements so the protection plus there's a lot to gain from my engagement with the special reps thank you Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Kavita. Uh, Kavita was also with uh, South Sudan uh, uh, operations until recently, uh, Cecilia. Uh, and Mary, you wanted to add something. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, William. Uh, so this is Anne-Marie, and I'm with the, the Libya protection sector. Uh, and just something that I think would be quite useful with uh, considering sort of climate displacement and other uh, discrimination or marginalized groups. So a lot of the groups that we do see who are displaced due to climate-related issues, due to primarily ours isn't slow in onset. We, we see some flooding. But uh, the areas of the country that are starting to truly see the effects of, of climate change are areas with already marginalized and disenfranchised uh, uh, minority populations reside. And so uh, the displacement of these groups uh, can often slip under the radar of the authorities. And I think what would be useful coming out of, out of a document for us, at least, would be to say, how do we support the government in strengthening their national legislation in creating these groups uh, to not be marginalized, I suppose, but also in understanding their displacement and responding to their displacement, uh, because I think oftentimes that does fall off the radar of our national authorities, uh, be that because of the, the conflict that's happening and sort of the large scale immediate effects of that, or, uh, or because of more systemic issues like the marginalization of, of the group in general. Uh, and then also something that sort of links into what South Sudan was saying uh, is the linkages not just with early recovery, but also with disaster risk reduction initiatives. Uh, I'm not very familiar with what sort of disaster risk reduction initiatives have been taking place in Libya, to be completely honest. Uh, but if we're talking about sort of rights and displacement of communities, somehow this needs to be linked into existing DRR initiatives, uh, either at the national or, or the global level. Yeah, so thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie. I will give the floor to Afghanistan. Uh, and then uh, maybe just after Cecilia, if you want to direct uh, uh, some, uh, some of the conversation in a specific direction, uh, that would be a good moment, I think, to, to take uh, some colleagues onwards. So Afghanistan, over to you. Um, thank you so much, William. Um, yes, so Afghanistan, as you know, is already struggling with conflict, but also um, the number of IDPs, the, the natural uh, climate-induced or natural disaster-induced displacement. And that's uh, something along with the conflict that has, you know, uh, made us all very busy. The, uh, I'm very glad, actually, that we have this discussion because the, the um, issue of climate change is something that we're already seeing its uh, impact in Afghanistan. As I mentioned, Afghanistan is prone to um, yearly flash floods, droughts, dust storms and locust storms, all um, because of um, either, you know, man-made uh, induced or natural uh, disaster or climate change uh, as a result of climate change. Um, so it's very important to address this. I think uh, this report would be very helpful because, as my colleagues also mentioned, I think so far, at least for the protection cluster in Afghanistan, I can tell you that we are being very reactive on this. Of course, uh, I mean, the, within the cluster, we work with communities to build the resilience of the community uh, in uh, response to shocks, but that by itself is not enough. We have to recognize the impact of especially slow onset disasters. And I think it will give us a good opportunity. It's one of the areas that we can um, collaborate uh, with development actor, uh, actors on Nexus. We already have started the discussions with development actors, not necessarily on climate change, but as you know, of course, to reduce the vulnerability with, you know, of the vulnerable population, which in Afghanistan, I mean, according to this HRP, we already have um, for about 13 million of, uh, you know, in a system of humanitarians. So those people are already very vulnerable. And as we know, um, that, that will increase the risk. 
um, and uh, they're already very exposed. We had the issue of drought in 2018, which is still continuing with the displacement population from that drought are still uh, displaced and more vulnerable. On a yearly basis, we have flood uh, displacement fl from flooding, and those um, IDPs are even more vulnerable um, because the population already, you know, suffering from the conflict, and they, they, once they become um, hit by the disaster, that there are um, more negative impact. So, um, to answer your question, um, how to better this report can help us. I think two things. One is to advocate, and it's not just in Afghanistan. I think some of this is regional. I mean, obviously, not that I think it's uh, proven that these are all regional, should be regional response to this the climate change issue, because what we see in Afghanistan, for example, on dust storm or um, drought or locust uh, attacks, the storm are also coming from neighboring countries. It's the effect that uh, climate change get having its toll on the neighboring countries. For example, a man-made disaster, uh, uh, um, drying up the marsh, the marshlands, for example, in eastern Iran, would have a negative impact in Afghanistan as well. Uh, in terms of creating dust storms or, uh, you know, the water issues in, you know, neighboring countries that uh, will have a negative impact. So it's, I think, first of all, to advocate that any uh, solution or initiative should also consider regional uh, discussion on this and also um, how we can work better together, either, you know, for in general for humanitarians and cluster to take into account um, uh, the climate change, especially slow and set disaster, and for the government also to recognize the IDPs that are, you know, as vulnerable as IDPs actually to uh, be able to assist them and for the IDPs to receive the assistance. Because as you know, for the slow and set disaster, it's very difficult to, to um, show that these people are actually IDPs because of this, because uh, it's not, you know, like um, um, uh, a disaster that every everybody knows about uh, that, you know, there are destructions. So that happens very gradually. And it's important for us to advocate with the government that to include this climate uh, induced displacement and IDPs into their national policies. And Afghanistan has already as their IDP national policies, but it's important for us also to, um, um, you know, advocate for um, the displaced population because of climate change uh, uh, to be considered in this group. Um, that's all from my side. I mean, uh, if I will get back to you with, to answer the questions, but thank you so much uh, for this very useful um, uh, session. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samira. Uh, Cecilia, before handing over to you, there is a, a, a one input from uh, Marie Emily Lozan. Maybe uh, she would want to elaborate uh, uh, orally. Marie. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what other colleagues were saying around the advocacy, you, the importance of advocacy. Um, you want to use, uh, just uh, uh, apologies, Ma uh, Cecilia Marie Emily is in Mali operation. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what other colleagues were saying on uh, the importance of uh, getting support to uh, advocate to integrate uh, protection and assistance to IDPs in, in national policies and national laws. Uh, we've been trying to work quite a lot here with the um, with national authorities in Mali, and there's been, I think, a momentum last year on uh, to adopt a, a national law on protection and assistance to IDPs. Uh, it seems that we've lost it a little bit because of other competing priorities, uh, but it's still on the agenda, and uh, and it's something we, as as the cluster, that we are trying to to push for. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Marie Emily. Uh, Cecilia, after these few interventions, is there any specific steer uh, you want us yeah. uh, to take? Yeah, thank you so much uh, to everybody who, who have uh, taken the floor. Um, I think there are several, I think about four points that I'd like to make. First is with regard to um, definitely what um, Anne-Marie was, oh no, sorry, Samira was saying about the 
difficulty of identifying IDPs. There is a, there is some um, controversy on that. Um, who are IDPs vis-a-vis -vis the context of slow onset um, uh, disasters, if you want? Uh, precisely because some may be looked at as migrants, and you know. Um, and some may be not. And, uh, and there is a difficulty here. I would tend to take a very liberal view in the interpretation of the descriptive definition of what we have in the guiding principles of internal displacement. Um, and that is to say that anybody, group of people or, or people who have been forced because they have had no choice or obliged to leave, regardless of any effect or direct effect of the climate change, uh, adverse effects of climate change. Um, this is really under debate right now, but in terms of, um, of identifying are these IDPs or not, and I, I will, as I said, take a liberal approach in that so long as there is that, you know, um, um, element of being forced to leave because they there's nothing, food security is gone, etc. For example, or um, otherwise they'll go hungry, uh, or their their houses are slowly being flooded, etc. Or the nomadic, um, how do you call this? Uh, the the nomadic um, uh, geography is um, is actually starting to be restricted more and more because of the um, loss, because of the certification, for example, particularly in, um, in Africa. So this for me is a very important starting point. And naturally, if I may just uh, go, I, several of you have mentioned the importance of national law and policy, and naturally, given that that is one of the priorities of my mandate, um, and, and particularly when also I, I continue that priority having taken over um, the my predecessors, um, this is really top of the uh, agenda. And naturally, using law and policy, and of course, any approaches to government in terms of advocacy is definitely uh, important. Um, for Africa, there is, of course, um, the importance of the ratification of the Kampala Convention. And I'm very happy, actually, that, well, it's still very slow, uh, I may say, but at least we've had about two or three ratifications in the last 12 months, or at least one and a half years. Um, except that, of course, um, in some areas, um, they were supposed to, at least in one country, they were supposed to deposit the ratification instrument, but COVID um, got into the way, much like what um, uh, has been shared concerning Mali. But it is important that this report takes up those important legal frameworks and policy frameworks. The other thing is I very much appreciate, so thank you very much, for highlighting the linkages with uh, development actors. Um, and not only from the beginning and engaging with early warning uh, mechanisms, national and uh, regional, but it is really important in, in my view to make this message loud and clear. And how that can be done, I think is really a challenge and we, we do, it's, 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 it's great to hear that from you because um, during my last consultation, who were mostly humanitarians and academics, um, I didn't hear much about that. So um, that, that's really good. And, and of course, the private sector, this, this one has been flagged to us very early on. And unfortunately, some of the private sector are themselves causes, um, contribute if you want, contribute to the um, adverse effects of slow onset climate change um, disasters. So how do we reconcile that with getting them on board um, for not only protection, but particularly for durable solutions? So any suggestions from you um, would definitely be uh, very uh, much appreciated. The other part is um, the, the, the aspect 
on the on identifying IDPs, as, as I had said earlier, but also the marginalized populations that uh, Anne-Marie from Libya had already um, uh, pointed out. We would like actually to get more information on that. And as I said at the beginning of, the, of this conversation, if you have any specific and concrete um, examples or figures or analysis that you would like to send to us in writing, please do so. We will be leaving you the email um, to which you can send. I mean, it doesn't have to be a report. It will just be, you know, Cecilia, this is what we have. This is what we know. It can be one paragraph, two paragraphs, and it may be non-attributable, attributable rather, if you don't wish to have it attributed because we want really the concrete um, inputs uh, to that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think I've covered the yeah, important Thank aspects. Thanks, William. Thanks, everybody. Thank you uh, very much, Cecilia. So I have uh, Keith, then Coco, then Alicia. Please introduce the operation uh, you are in. Keith, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, thanks uh, very much to Severin uh, who covered most of the points. Um, uh, and uh, so what I want to add is uh, that um, uh, we have uh, most of our um, um, IDPs in, in, um, in Burundi, in Burundi are, uh, um, are climate change uh, induced uh, displacements. They're displaced because of, uh, because of floods and um, landslides um, and uh, also to say that um, you know they they have um, you know there, there's very little land in Burundi so access to land is is a major issue um, and uh, also we have um, you know the, the, the government is is uh, has a difficult relationship with the international community since uh, since the events of um, the, the failed elections of uh, 2015. Um, and at that time, about 400,000 people fled uh, to, to neighboring countries. And, um, but about 23% of our uh, IDPs, according to uh, DTM, um, consistently show up as, as those displaced for other reasons since 2015. The, the new uh, displacements uh, are um, displaced because of uh, climate change issues. Um, so, um, so yes, climate change is very relevant. Um, you know, the natural disasters, um, yeah. Severin, if I forgot anything, please add again. Thanks a lot. Time. Thanks very much, Keith. Let me move on to uh, Coco. Coco, can you hear me? Hello, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Please present your operation and proceed. Okay, thank you. I'm Felicity Coco. The um, a cluster coordination for Niger. Okay, concerning the input, we are pre preparing the inputs that you will share, but uh, relating to the question uh, on how useful this report can be for the state, I would say that in Niger, we have since uh, December 2018, a national law on IDP protection and the uh, displacements for natural disaster in also included in the law and uh, they are working on the law enforcement modalities and uh, the cluster is supporting the, the government for the vulgarization. But in practice, we can notice that uh, most of the actors are involved in uh, displacement uh, due to conflict and also uh, when we have floods. So the government is appealing all actors to, to, to support them in those flood situations. But the other uh, disasters like um, drought are dealt with another deep, um, department of the government with uh, development actors and clusters are not really necessarily involved. So I think that this report 
may assist the government to deal with uh, natural disaster displacement as a whole, but uh, also allow a, a better involvement of uh, all uh, humanitarian actors. Okay, thank you. And I'm available if you have questions. Thank you very much, Coco. This is uh, much appreciated. Uh, let me turn on to the Americans. Alicia, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that the protection cluster in Honduras has not specifically um, addressed displacement due to climate change. Um, we really focused more on violence, so I'm basing most of this on reports and literature that already exists about um, climate change and displacement in Honduras. But I think that what we have in common with many of the other people who've already spoken today um, in other countries is that oftentimes there is um, sort of an intersection between the climate-based migration and then also the um, displacement based on violence. Um, the main issue that's been reported on Honduras is uh, people displacing because of droughts um, and because of El Nino and how that's affected agricultural workers. Um, people tend to move from the rural area to a more urban area and then often in the urban areas are then dis there could be a secondary displacement because of um, different types of violence, uh, especially gang-based violence in Honduras, which then oftentimes leads to um, an international displacement or you know, seeking asylum in another country. Um, one of the other common themes um, in what's been reported so far is the difficulty in um, identifying people who have been displaced because of climate change versus violence versus other types of reasons. And as others have said, sort of the lumping in of people who have been displaced because of climate change with other types of migrants. Um, from what I've seen, there has been an increase in the number of agricultural workers who have been apprehended by U.S. migration authorities in the United States since 2014, which is when the drought became more serious in Honduras. But again, there's not really a predictable or organized way of collecting that data um, or identifying these people. And, you know, there are reports that say that between 1 million and 2 million people could be at risk of future displacement because of climate change. Um, but I think that identification of this population continues to be a challenge. So it would be great in the report, um, as others have said, if there could be um, some sort of guidance about identifying climate-based displaced people. Um, and then also on the side of the state response, right now in Honduras, we've um, there's been a law that's been presented to Congress um, for the protection of people who have been displaced because of violence, which hasn't really seen any action, even though it was um, presented in March 2019, again, because of other um, legislative priorities. And so I think that Going back to the the concept note that it would also be useful to sort of have some recommendations for local human rights authorities of how to monitor this situation and how to report on it, how to advocate um, for a state response. Um, because, again, I think that the, the problem is very much linked to um, other types of displacement, um, at least in the context of Honduras, and so it's important to be able to identify um, both the differences and the similarities um, with other people who have been displaced for other reasons. Um, yeah, so thank you. That was it on my side. Oh, sorry. Someone Thanks. else just mentioned, saw in the comments that there was also a comment about um, specific population groups. Um, and I think that's also of utmost importance in the Americas and in Honduras, um, particularly with indigenous people um, who have traditionally made their living off of uh, agriculture and sort of the effect of climate change on ancestral lands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia, for the comprehensive update. Uh, I give the floor to Inata, then Florence, then Christophe. Inata. Please introduce yourself and uh, 
good morning, everybody. My name is Minata uh, from DRC Cluster Protection. Uh, here in DRC, we have more than 5 million IDPs, but uh, more than 99% per, uh, uh, conflict-induced displacement. We do have also IDPs, uh, natural disaster-induced uh, displacement in the north and also in the south uh, east of the country. And we have also minority groups uh, that are living around the Lake Tanganyika uh, that is now being affected by uh, clim climate change. Uh, 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 and those people could also be affected by the uh, the fact that the lake is now uh, less rich in fish, that is some of their, that constitute income for them and also part of their uh, uh, living, uh, li living uh, from Lake Tanganyika. Uh, the, the, the way the, the, to answer to the question how the report will be useful, I would say uh, it is right we are now using uh, the guiding principle uh, everywhere in the world, but the, it, the report will be very useful if it can help uh, strengthen national legislation on the, uh, the protection of the right of IDPs, like encouraging uh, regional uh, legal frameworks that are already in place, encouraging uh, countries to sign, ratify, and also have national laws uh, that will, that are enforceable uh, to protect the right of IDPs. In Congo, we have more than 5 million IDPs, but uh, Congo has signed the Kampala Convention, but has not yet ratified the convention. Besides all the advocacy, UNHCR and all humanitarian country team has been doing. And even yes, last year, UNHCR uh, conducted a big conference, international conference, to discuss with all stakeholders about the ratification of the convention to show to uh, the civil the authorities and also to the civil society the importance of the ratification of the convention. Uh, still, it has not yet been ratified. The cluster protection has been pushing with the our ministry, our counterpart ministry, is the Ministry for Solidarity and Humanitarian Action. And the document has still not yet been uh, deposited at the, uh, as it was supposed to be done. So I think uh, also uh, engaging uh, state responsibilities uh, for the protection of IDPs would also be useful. Uh, for 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 this report, uh, that is what I, I wanted to add, like encouraging state to ratify a regional uh, convention and domesticate the convention by having national laws and enforcing those laws uh, would help uh, in the protection of IDPs. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Florence, the floor is yours, uh, followed by Christophe and Buda. Florence. Hi, William. This is Nancy. Florence sent me a separate message that she had to leave. Um, but she wanted to flag that um, in her in the chat box. Um, many thanks, William and Cecilia. It would be interesting in the report to have the views from affected communities on their protection needs in this context, especially in the Sahel countries, as we lack data analysis on slow onset event impacts on internal displacement, but also concrete examples of good practices in preventing and anticipating internal displa displacement in this context, better protecting IDPs in this context through the Kampala Convention, for instance, and increasing the most vulnerable people's resilience. And she also flagged good practices in planned relocation protection and considerations of protection risk for IDPs to be displaced across borders in, the, in this context or potential risk of statelessness. Um, Florence works with uh, the UNHCR Climate Action. Over to you. 
Thanks uh, a lot, Nancy. Uh, so let me move on uh, to uh, to Christoph, uh, followed by Zuhair, then Yassin. Christoph. Thank you. Hello, colleagues, and hello, Cecilia. I'm uh, talking I'm as cluster coordinator for uh, for Somalia. Um, just to say that uh, I think for Somalia, the the best work which has been done on uh, conflict induced, uh, sorry, uh, climate change induced displacement is probably the report by IDMC uh, last uh, March, where, where there is uh, uh, information and perspective of IDPs, which is quite interesting. On data, what is clear for uh, in Somalia is that, yes, we, we disaggregate uh, displacement by cause of displacement, conflict insecurity on one side, drought, flood, flood. But we always refer to these causes as the primary causes with the understanding that everything is mixed indeed. And uh, the conflict uh, usually have also a background of uh, uh, competition over resources which are being depleted because of uh, because of conflict um, of uh, sorry climate change, in particular water or grazing land. So um, in the end, the um, the, the yes, it's it's important. It's interesting to know to know this disaggregation by cause, but uh, but everything is linked, and and uh, in Somalia it, it is surely the case. As far as uh, as the legal framework is concerned, um, Somalia has just has ratified uh, and deposited the instrument uh, uh, early this year for Kampala, uh, and UNHCR will work with uh, Professor Bayani. Uh, and lead consultation with all stakeholders here to uh, look at the national uh, legal framework, normative framework, uh, so to contextualize the, the Kampala Convention. So I must say that uh, specific guidance which may come in your report uh, on climate change uh, will surely uh, call for a lot of attention at this particular time and, and, and in this process of the development of the legal framework here in Somalia. Uh, I would like to do a remark on uh, the marginalized communities uh, of which we have uh, a lot in, in Somalia. So people who don't belong to the mainstream dominant clans, basically, and who are, who are the, 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 the most uh, severely affected uh, communities, um, affected by, uh, by conflict, affected by, uh, by the climate change. They lose uh, and they have already lost their land and they receive very li little attention when it comes to uh, to development and inclusion in development uh, programs, including those who may be developed for uh, responding to or preventing or mitigating the effect of, of climate change. Um, and a last remark to also highlight how difficult it is to um, to move uh, the, the issue of displacement from the humanitarian agenda towards the, the development agenda, including with regard to climate change. In Somalia, we have uh, the example of floods. Every year, we have really floods which affect thousands of people along the two main rivers, the Shabele and uh, Juba, Juba. And every year we complain, ah, why don't we uh, restore the banks? Uh, why don't we uh, 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 drain the, the, the riverbeds better? Uh, where, where is the money for that and who will take the lead? And year after year, there is no lead. Year after year, no funding is available. And uh, this year, uh, actually, the government has uh, has taken the things a bit more seriously and, and uh, made a plan on uh, <clears throat> on restoration of, of banks along the Shabele River in particular. I can share that with you if you if you want an example. Uh, the issue will be funding, and this is where also uh, uh, linking with the financial institution and, and making sure that they are serious in their commitments on the, the climate change agenda for funding. Uh, uh, the, the relevant um, development response is, is quite critical. So I'm talking of the, the World Bank in particular, or uh, regional banks. Uh, and I understand that the World Bank for Somalia has stepped in with a bit of funding for precisely uh, preventing floods. So it's a good example, but uh, it has been so slow. So a good signal from you, uh, Cecilia, in your report uh, towards the, the financial institutions would be uh, surely uh, helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe. Uh, William, may I maybe intervene at this point now? Her, I was just going to say that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
see, William and I were together in uh, Iraq. I invited William to be part of my delegation and my visit to Iraq, and I think we now read each other's minds. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, um, colleagues, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, what what I'm hearing is a lot with regard to. Well, first of all, of course, the frameworks, the legal and national uh, legal and policy of frameworks, both at the regional level, but also at the national level. But in relation to this, I think there is more um, a resonance on accountability of governments. Also, I'm looking at the chat box and this <clears throat> this will definitely be um, be included in the report. And, and this is why I think it's really, really important if we get very specific um, uh, examples concretely uh, on, on where this can be done and as effectively as uh, possible. Um, I also hear a lot with regard to how the the attention is more on conflict um, and as well as like in Honduras on, for example, in gang violence, basically conflict and, and violence. But I think it is really important to upscale the attention to the other kinds of uh, IDPs. Again, as, as um, Christoph says, there is no one driver, but it's all interlinked. And I think that interlinkages, interlinkage, is something that we definitely um, would like to to highlight. Um, there was also something concerning. Oh, yeah, I I think it was Christoph who who brought it up, and uh, the role of the IFIs. Um, Christoph, I would love to have that. Um, Christoph and I also work together. So hi, hello, Christoph. Um, I would love to have the, that um, example, specific example on what the government is doing. Um, it may or may not be submitted to us by uh, Somalia, because remember that I've also asked the states to give specific examples and, and answer the, the, the any of the 10 questions um, in my call of inputs. But if you can just give me a blurb on that, and if there is any reference, further reference that you can also cite that we can look at um, separately, that would be lovely. And of course, that goes to everybody in this um, in this uh, consultation. Um, data is, of course, yeah, we've already spoken about data um, and we are trying to get as much data as uh, possible. Um, with regard to Honduras, what you are saying uh, was actually very interesting. Um, I, I did a working visit to Honduras about two years ago, and frankly, I have not heard anything concerning climate change. Um, and, and I think it's important to to really um, have that as part and parcel of the of the discussion. Um, with regard to lawmaking, um, I think Somalia and Niger have uh, mentioned it. Um, and, and Felicite, uh, you, you know very well that I went to Niger on an official visit, and it would be fantastic if I can get, um, if if there could be some um, some contribution on on specifically on how the um, national law can be actually useful. Um, in terms of getting the climate change IDPs, quote unquote, on the agenda, um, because the purpose, of, one of the purposes of my uh, outcomes, concrete outcomes of my visit to Niger was actually the adoption of the national law. So I can actually also be in a position to bilaterally push Niger because I visited Niger. I have recommendations in that. And in addition, if I can include Niger as a very specific example on a national law that can be useful for climate change uh, IDPs, I can also push Niger on that. Um, and that hopefully will also help you in, in, the, in that regard. Same with Somalia, um, even though I haven't been able to um, visit Somalia, um, uh, Christoph, but the fact that they have ratified the K K Kampala Convention 
and in South Sudan as well, um, very recently, you know, those are hooks that I can use um, with that, that in terms of extrapolating my report to those hooks, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. Uh, so with your remarks in mind, I'll hand over to Yasin, followed by Zuhair, Mwihaki, Jorge, Muhammad, and Fanta. Yasin, the floor is yours. Thank you, William, and hello, colleagues, uh, wherever you are, and hope you are safe. And hello, Cecilia. We met in uh, in Libya two, three years back uh, during your visit to Libya. So, uh, looking to to Syria, um, is, so if we look to the Syria, the uh, protracted nature of the crisis continue to create increasingly complex and uh, interconnected protection issue and needs that affect all population groups. Uh, we're talking about 10 years of conflict resulted in, in, in more than 6 million uh, IDBs and also around 5 million refugees outside the country. Um, however, conflict, armed conflict, still the main uh, 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 cause of conflict, but uh, cause of displacement. However, talking about 10 years of conflict, the conflict itself, it's become like a dr driver to other cause uh, to displacement. So we are looking any any uh, environmental or access to market or COVID things due to the conflict become a new cause of, of, of displacement. Uh, like looking in the last uh, few weeks, where is uh, the lira, uh, the currency of the uh, of the Syrian uh, have been collapsed, which is also start leading thousand and thousand of people moving from place to another, looking, trying to have access to market and jobs. Uh, and job also. So one of the things um, uh, I don't think, which is Syria is unique of it, uh, which is also preventing uh, the partner, including protection and humanitarian partners to have a concrete and long term intervention to, to, to help on finding durable solution for displacement is the sanction. So a lot of protection uh, humanitarian partners are not able to bring uh, money or resources or material to the country to or to have a long term project uh, or objectives to try to find a solution uh, to the displacement because of the sanction put on, on Syria because of the political issue uh, and, and uh, a lot of partners not trying and doing advocacy in the last uh, few years. Uh, to, to find a way to, to be supported, to to make it clear to the international community that sanction cannot include the humanitarian assistance. So this is something we, I think we have to work globally. Uh, maybe there is also not only Syria, there are places where we can as a humanitarian find a way not to include uh, under these sanctions because of political, um, uh, political reason. Uh, so, um, uh, so this is one of the main issue. I'm, I'm sure aware of lots of colleagues aware of the Syrian crisis, but that's my hope. That's uh, like um, a special reporter or colleagues can take this issue, looking how we can do as a humanitarian to find a way to be something from all this political and sanction issue to be able to have a long term. Uh, intervention and also to have a dialogue with the government, whatever the government uh, committing is doing, but we still need to have that dialogue as still uh, the government controlling like 70-80% of the country and we are not able to do anything uh, uh, without their approval. Meanwhile, we have a lot of pressure uh, from the donor and international community for not uh, interacting with the authorities, which is not uh, benefiting the humanitarian and protection actors to, to do something about displacement and support return. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yassine. Uh, 
I have seven more speakers, and I, I will stop with these seven and then hand over back to uh, to Cecilia for next steps. So, uh, Zuhair, uh, followed by Muitaki. Zuhair, go ahead. Uh, hello, colleagues. Uh, this is uh, Zuhair Imam, uh, Protection Cluster Sudan. Uh, just I will start with uh, the uh, legal framework for uh, IDPs in Sudan. Actually, uh, Sudan not ratified the uh, Kampala Convention yet, and we don't have also a national IDP law. However, we have uh, national policy uh, on uh, IDPs uh, uh, regarding the uh, natural disaster the induced displacement yeah the uh, the policy uh, 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 include uh, you know uh, recognized those who are displaced by natural disaster as idps uh, the the uh, uh, it goes without saying that sudan uh, you know uh, before the revolution and sudan after revolution it's completely different and uh, now with this uh, new political development, really we are as a protection uh, cluster here in Sudan. Uh, we are uh, advocating with the government to ratify, to sign and ratify uh, Kampala Convention. Uh, I think that's the first step. Uh, then we will uh, see how we can go with the uh, national IDP policy. Uh, I believe that uh, it's it's uh, the the. Uh, ratification of uh, Kampala Convention is uh, a priority and and the uh, for the national policy it need to be updated also because I think it's out lot now uh, outdated uh, so also I think we uh, we, we we can uh, include uh, the uh, the natural disaster that climate change and national natural disaster agenda in 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 the uh, uh, the uh, uh, policy i um, the coordination uh, what i want to say because here in sudan regarding the natural disaster actually we have like uh, three uh, or three main um, types uh, we have the the the, the uh, flood uh, desertification and and nino but uh, mainly flood uh, you know uh, is the the the, uh, the one that you know has coordination mechanism within the ISCG, uh, which protection cluster participating in. The uh, there is also a national flood task force led by the humanitarian aid commission. What I want to say here, uh, there is no multi hazard coordination mechanisms, and uh, the this issue because uh, like uh, you know some. Uh, even the the government counterparts, because we have some uh, development uh, uh, government counterparts, they are working separately. So that's why I believe uh, the uh, humanitarian development peace nexus is very very important when it comes to the issues related to uh, climate change and uh, natural disaster. Uh, the uh, also the uh, data. Uh, uh, I, we have uh, we, we don't have like uh, good information management system uh, regarding other type of uh, natural disasters. For example, uh, the flood. Uh, uh, we have coordination mechanism for flood, but as humanitarian, we don't have that type of coordination mechanism for uh, other type of uh, natural disaster. Uh, the uh, uh, I uh, I see the 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 impact of uh, this uh, flood it's compared to the conflict induced displacement it's you have it's few uh, like for example we have uh, more than 3 million uh, idps in sudan conflict induced uh, uh, idps and uh, last year just let me uh, read yeah 400000 uh, displaced due to flood uh, I fully agree with the colleagues who uh, highlighted, you know, the, the regional coordination and internally also, I think we need also to uh, give more attention uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the uh, uh, climate change and uh, natural disaster displacement. Uh, uh, we need also to do our uh, homework. 
I uh, I don't know, but for me, I think from legal perspective, also uh, the accountability of the of the government, as we know, you know, when it comes to uh, financial, most of the countries uh, 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 predicted to be affected uh, by uh, the uh, natural disaster are in Sahel in Africa. So very, you know, it's the, the issue of financial is uh, it's really uh, important to to uh, to draw attention to draw the attention to and uh, so that's why I fully agree with my colleague uh, Christophe regarding you know the involvement of uh, uh, donors and uh, early warning early action uh, because even internally uh, from the legal perspective the constitution and you know the realization of economic uh, social and cultural rights uh, have less attention than, you know, even I don't know if it's in, in other countries globally, uh, less attention than the uh, uh, the political, uh, civil and political rights. And th those, you know, affected by the uh, climate change and natural disasters, uh, most of their rights related to economic, social, cultural rights. What I want to say, I think also in our agenda, uh, for Sicilia, I think uh, the uh, economic and social and cultural rights, uh, more push also we need uh, on this. Uh, thank you and over to you, William. Thank you very much uh, Zuhair, for the comprehensive uh, inputs. Uh, let me hand over to Muihaki. Good, good evening, colleagues. I'm Winaki Kinyanjui. I'm uh, coming in into Nigeria as a senior protection officer based in Abuja. And uh, I will be very, very brief because uh, we have uh, provided some written comments on uh, a, a number of the points that uh, Cecilia has requested in the call for inputs. But I would want to highlight the fact that um, uh, in Nigeria, the conflict continues in the northeast region. Since uh, 2009, we've, uh, we've seen that uh, Boko Haram and the non-armed non groups have taken advantage of uh, vulnerable communities around the Lake Chad basin in the northeast region. And the, this conflict is uh, gone on, it's over now 10 years, but it's important to, to note that um, as we are addressing the impact on the vulnerable communities and the displaced population, um, where to begin to, to, to identify whether the, the, the cause of displacement is conflict or was originally as as a result of, uh, of uh, climate change, the impact, the conflict between the herding community and the farming communities. This is an issue that we continuously see because in the Northeast region, uh, it's suffering from desertification, deforestation and drought, and these continue to escalate the conflict between the nomadic communities and the and the and the farming communities so this is something that has consistently been seen and it is being recognized that um, with consistent changes in rainfall and uh, and 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 uh, hot and drier conditions this will exacerbate uh, floods droughts and hamper agricultural production and um Agriculture accounts for around 23% of the GDP for Nigeria. So when 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 climate change, the impact it's very slow. However, it impacts communities and pushes them to the edge. These are issues that are being seen, even when you analyze the the, the changing nature of the conflict. In terms of um, in terms of uh, some examples of uh, what Nigeria has done. Uh, it did ratify the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement and made uh, seven point plans as laid down by the president. However, how this report would assist is in terms of uh, 
or accountability with regard to the commitments that states have made in terms of the implementation because they made the commitment they signed but in terms of the concrete implementation of those seven points laid out in the president's commitment um the other issue that i wanted to highlight is the fact that um the conflict um between herders and farmers in Nigeria is, is, has been seen to have a southward movement as uh, herders uh, search for more grazing land and it has resulted in further crashes, expanding the, 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 the range of the conflict. And uh, in certain instances, you find uh, internally displaced persons not being displaced once, but several times. Uh, one of the key issues that uh, that uh, this report uh, would would help is an advocacy with regard to uh, documentation, and and when we talk about documentation, is documentation that will be will be recognized by the the state governments even down at the regional level because we have the federal state and we have the local government uh, um, uh, authorities. So if there's documentation to communities with regard to where they reside, with regard to where, they, um, uh, where they, 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 their, their resources are, it could help when it comes to uh, reclaiming housing and property rights when there is uh, uh, the process to, 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 to reclaim properties. So that is one area that will be most helpful with regard to, to this report. Thank you. Thank you. And, and other details, other details are, are included in, in our written report, in our written comments. Perfect. Thank you so much. Colleagues, and a true protection coordinator session. It took us a while to warm up. Now I have to start uh, limiting the time of your intervention. So, uh, Jorge, then Ahmad, then Ponta, then Sarah, then Jessica, if you can limit your intervention to one minute uh, and then follow up uh, in writing, that would be great. Uh, Jorge, the floor is yours. Good morning. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, please go ahead. Can you hear me, William? Loud and clear. Please uh, go ahead. Okay. I'm Jorge Alvarez Nievas, Protection Officer in El Salvador and Coordinator in the cluster. Uh, only very shortly, I would like to to explain that last January, uh, the General Assembly approved the comprehensive and law for an special law for IDPs, but uh, climate changes was not included in the in the law. Despite the fact, uh, currently we are dealing with uh, a storm Amanda. Uh, in this in this sense, uh, it could be important that climate changes will be uh, included in the in the project of law over thank you so much uh, Jorge for the brevity and uh, the clarity of the thought uh, Muhammad thank you very much uh, William and Cecilia for organizing this session and uh, greetings to all colleagues. Uh, in Philippines, we have uh, more than uh, 374,000 persons being displaced due to armed conflict, uh, natural disasters and violence. However, almost 55% of this displacement is caused by natural disasters. So we're talking about more than 207,000 persons due to Philippines location along with the typhoon built and ring of fires, which makes it prone to typhoons, floods and earthquakes. But we can also see droughts coming to Philippines from time to time, which forces people to move uh, to different locations. In Philippines, there is a, a legislative and policy framework to address climate change as well as managing and mitigating disasters. However, it seems that there is an inconsistency in terms of implementation of these policies amongst local governments. 
and this is because of different capacities, resources, and uh, other support that is available to the local L uh, LGUs, to local governments. In some areas, local officials are not even aware of these laws and policies. Um, Philippines is actually quite advanced in terms of developing a national climate change action plan with strategic priorities of food, uh, security, water, ecosystem and environmental stability. Um, in terms of our recommendations from Philippines to the report, we would like to make two recommendations. One is to ensure that displacement is on the identified risk situations that impact human security under this uh, national climate change uh, and further enhance the capacities and provide support to local governments. Thank you very much, uh, William. Over to you and colleagues. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Cecilia knows a little bit about the Philippines. So, uh, yes, I actually seem <laughs> always uh, awkward to talk about Philippines <laughs> and looking at Cecilia because she uh, she's, of course, uh, from Philippines. She's been working uh, with the government and partners and she supported us a lot in a number of activities. So uh, I would like to Thanks. kindly, yes, uh, also look at Cecilia and for her additional contribution and insight on Philippines. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You uh, so. yeah. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, Fanta, uh, the floor is yours. If you can limit the intervention to one minute, that would be OK, uh, thank you. Uh, Fanta is my name, uh, Divisa Cluster Coordinator in South Sudan. Uh, I will try to be very brief. Uh, uh, the point that I want to mention is about uh, how uh, not a single isolated event, but a multiple uh, incidents of uh, IDP situation that could be driven by multiple factors are really creating uh, protection related issues uh, and also vulnerability to women, uh, girls, children, and also even people with disability and other vulnerable groups. Uh, looking at uh, our regional situation, when I say region, I'm looking at around the Horn of Africa, where we have South Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and the likes. Uh, the, the issue of uh, climate-induced uh, uh, hazard profiles are increasing, as it might be the case uh, in, in any other part of the world. Uh, but uh, looking at uh, the South Sudan context, for instance, when we are talking about uh, climate-induced IDPs, we should not treat it as something as an isolated, because even if we say conflict-related uh, IDP vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the climate change uh, induced, uh, the situation might happen in a circumstances where uh, a given population, the same population might, might have been affected by armed conflict. Again, that will be followed, uh, followed up by, let's say, flooding or drought, which is also climate-induced IDP. And then after that, before they heal or before they recover or build up their asset, again, they will be affected by another form of conflict, which is intercommunal violence or uh, cattle raiding. So all these uh, multitude drivers of conflict, even if we have to look at the intersection between conflict and uh, uh, climate-induced IDPs, we have to bear in mind that the consequence and the degree of severity may vary from place to place and that that issue should be into consideration when we are designing our policy papers, especially one size does not fit all. That is one point. The other thing which I won't talk about is uh, in terms of uh, the level of uh, awareness and response, even if we are talking about uh, climate induced IDPs from my own experience in Ethiopia in 2016-2017, Drought would not have equal attention as it as flooding can bring. Most of the time, those slow onset uh, climate change induced IDPs, uh, they tend to be not to get the appropriate attention bid by the government authorities or the humanitarian actors. So that is also another important aspect that we have to focus in. Uh, the third thing is about mine action, specifically looking at our context here in South Sudan. Some locations have uh, those uh, ordinances which need to be cleared even before accessing IDPs. So uh, wh while we are talking about IDPs, we have to also look at some of the limiting factors, even if the policy environment is clearly stipulated and allowing access to provide humanitarian assistance, 
but then we have to also look at the other aspect like for instance uh, as i've said the uh, mine issue which may severely affect access to provide the monthly humanitarian assistance these are my points thank Thanks. you uh, yeah. thank you so much uh, Fanta. Uh, sarah the floor is yours Uh, thank you very much, um, Sarah Pallison, Protection Cluster Coordinator in uh, chat. Um, and thank you very much to the Special Rapporteur for this um, opportunity and initiative. I just wanted to echo a little bit what's been said by our colleagues in Nigeria and draw attention to the Lake Chad Basin. Um, and perhaps in follow up to this call, I will share a couple of resources in addition to the comments that we'll make um, on, the, on the document shared. Um, but basically in the Lake Chad Basin, while uh, conflict remains the main driver of displacement, um, most of the people who live in the, in, the, in the basin subsist mainly on farming, fish, fishing and pastoral livelihoods and have been deeply affected by uh, and also displaced by climate change linked to the diminishing of the lake over the past uh, 60 years. I think the estimate is that it's shrunk around 90% since, since the 1960s. And there is a study made by the organization Climate Refugees in 2007, which highlights that some of the first displacement uh, in the basin were actually due to, to, to climate change. And I also would like to emphasize the point uh, made by my colleague in uh, Sudan on the importance of the nexus, the humanitarian development and peace nexus, where I think we are seeing in Chad, we're seeing some positive examples and also um, other areas where we, wish, we, we may wish to see more focus on climate change in, um, in, uh, in policies and in regional dialogues and national strategies. Um, one positive example, though, is the um, Provincial Security and Development Plan for the Lake Chad province for 2019 and 2023 that has as one of its specific, um, one of its five strategic objectives, a focus on building resilience, um, focus on renewable energy and um, addressing some of the structural um, development issues that are making IDPs and other marginalized groups specifically vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So that's, I think, a positive example, and I'll be happy to share the, the strategy. Um, another point, though, which may ish warrant a, a recommendation and something to be brought out in uh, by the special operator would be if you look at the um, the regional protection dialogues for the Lake Chad basins that have been taking place. Um, the first one was in 2016, the second one in uh, last year. Um, amongst the key engagement made by the by the um, the four states countries in the Lake Chad basin, you don't see climate change come out very clearly, and all the four countries are now. Um, have developed national action plans that they're taking forward and maybe that would be something to look at how um, how more action on climate change can be integrated into the the action plans following what's called the the Abuja declaration uh, which really is a very high level government commitment to addressing uh, peace and security and development issues in the Lake Chad Basin. I'll stop there um, and thank you very much Thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. And last uh, but not least, uh, Jessica. And then I'll go hand over to Cecilia for wrapping up. Jessica. Hello, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. The, the internet has been Hello, not so you. great again today. Um, so, good afternoon from Mozambique. Um, uh, just to touch upon some of the, the issues that have been discussed, and it's interesting to hear from colleagues from other operations, and I, I can see that there's a lot of similarities um, that also apply to our context here in Mozambique. So, here in Mozambique, we've had multiple and, and, and consecutive emergencies and an overlapping humanitarian needs. 
uh, in 2019, there were two uh, major cyclones uh, that hit Mozambique coast, one in central Mozambique and, and one in the north. Uh, in addition, we have serious food insecurity, droughts in the southern part of the country, as well as a uh, situation of insecurity that is uh, increasing. Um, now, last year the, alone, this left more than 2.5 million people uh, in need of humanitarian assistance, which is more than 10% of the country's total population. Um, uh, in, in addition, we have 1.4 million people food insecure uh, and a low rain season uh, in early 2020, which has led to also secondary needs such as malnutrition uh, and disease outbreaks in communities. Um, so these multiple and overlapping emergencies and humanitarian needs have been quite a challenge for us to also address uh, with a in a relatively small operation. So we've had to scale up quite significantly um, and to, to um, set up a response that responds to not only multiple and overlapping needs, but also in different parts of the country, ranging from extreme drought and food insecurity in the south to serious uh, weather events, uh, flooding and, and rain in the north and, and the center of the country, as well as conflict in the north. Um, the Kampala Convention has been signed by the government of Mozambique, uh, but not ratified. Um, there is no national law in Mozambique to cover internal displacement and, and even the definition and understanding of what is an internally displaced person is, is not uh, well understood. There's also not a clear um, uh, structure on the government side as to the protection coordination of, of IDP response here in Mozambique. Um, and there's been some significant restructuring also in the government uh, in, in the past six months. Um, I echo also what some other colleagues said about regional coordination and, and some of these uh, climate-induced disasters are very much uh, symptomatic and, and common in, in southern Africa, such as droughts and other serious weather events. So regional coordination is, is of utmost importance. Um, we also need to strengthen the government leadership and commitment to, to passing the Kampala Convention um, to ensure that internal displacement, including displacement caused by serious weather event, events, which by the way, Mozambique is highly um, probable to, to have reoccurring and new weather events similar to the scale as what we had last year. Um, so uh, ratification of Kampala Convention is of high importance, um, which also then would allow further promotion um, of durable solutions. So last month, um, UNHCR handed over to coordination of protection work in response to uh, Cyclone Idai in central Mozambique to government authorities. But there seems to be across the board amongst humanitarian partners quite a limited uh, understanding and somewhat um, mixed understanding of, of whether a durable solution has been found to the situation of displacement that is purely caused by uh, a natural disaster uh, or not. So our understanding is that there continue to be more than 100,000 people alone in central Mozambique displaced by a cyclone without a proper durable solution. So the protection cluster is also engaged to, to strengthen the humanitarian development nexus in this field. Um, so I think that's, that's an overview of the situation here. And thank you for this opportunity and platform to discuss. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Cecilia, this has been uh, rich. Uh, I give you the floor for uh, closing remarks. Okay. Well, um, listen, William, it's really been very rich. Thank you so much, um, colleagues in the field. Um, and it's, um, I mean, I'm, we are getting a lot of reaffirmations, but we are also I'm we're, we're also getting um, some very interesting emphasis on, of course, law and policy um, and the implementation of such law and policy where they do exist. And of course, it's also very interesting for me because in Africa there is um, quite more emphasis, if you want, on regional coordinator, a coordination which does not necessarily um, exist in other continents. 
So, um, and, and, and I think that would be a very good angle to make, a, make in the report um, because it would be uh, very interesting to link not only the Kampala Convention in regional coordination, but in also in other um, uh, processes like uh, what was um, emphasized on the Abuja Declaration and the, um, you know, the Lake Chad uh, Basin, so to speak. Um, I, I think it's uh, the other thing I picked up very interestingly is, of course, this emphasis not only on the multiplicity of uh, events and, of course, of drivers, but also uh, what the last speaker said from Mozambique concerning the overlapping protection uh, needs. And I think it would be important for us, I think, to, to, to get more information on that because the last question we have in the quest in the call for inputs is not only with regard to the interlinkage between climate change and um, and conflict and violence, for example, in terms of causes and protection needs, etc., but also in terms of um, unfortunate the unfortunate division that uh, protection needs are not being looked at holistically, but rather depending on the driver. Of the um, of the displacement, and as you have, most of you have already rightly described, these drivers of uh, displacement are actually very much uh, interlinked. I think I will stop there also because uh, we're running out of time. But um, no, it's been very very rich. So I really would like to thank everybody um, who have uh, participated in this. I also am looking at the uh, chat box. And we are taking note of that. I think this, this, William, Nancy, this um, uh, consultation is being recorded, so that would be very helpful um, to our note takers and, of course, to the um, to the drafting of the report. I have, I think, two, three or four uh, people of my support team in here. Um, I will be typing in the in the box um, where we ask you to send written contributions. So it's idp at ohchr.org and one of my support staff, Natalia, um, is uh, in charge of that. So and so if there's anything, please, please do submit inputs. But this consultation has been very helpful in the framing of the, the issues. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nancy and, and and of course, especially William, and to all the people who have um, contributed to this rich discussion. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, this was a success. It was rich. It was uh, cool and fresh and uh, very relevant. I think uh, we will do uh, similar consultations uh, more often. Uh, I think we should, we should aim at having twice or thrice a year uh, to, to create that uh, local to global linkage and uh, benefit from, uh, from your uh, advocacy voice and, uh, and as well as uh, uh, share with you uh, our field knowledge in a more uh, structured way. Colleagues uh, in operations, I thank you so much. I know how precious it is uh, to take two hours of your time. Uh, for the consultation away from operations. Uh, I promise, uh, uh, knowing Cecilia, that uh, this will pay off in advocacy uh, and hopefully you manage to, uh, to move some uh, elements forward in your operations. With this, I thank you all uh, and uh, wish you all a good evening and good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Good night from here.